learning something new, isn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. It is it is good to start something new, and uh, but to also remember the old and to re- recall things and continue in our studies. So yeah, we are taking a break in 1689, but uh, Lord willing, we will get back to that at some point as we continue through doctrinal teachings and such. So you can put those, uh, you know, at the house or in your backpacks or. I know Sky's got his bag there with all his studies and notebooks in there. So um, I do have new notebooks provided, as you'll see, and pens on the on the table in front of you. So you guys know that I'm a big advocate for note taking. Uh, certainly, studies show that you know your best students are note takers, and that you will recall things better if you write them down. Um, so you know, certainly, I'm not going to uh, you know whack you or give you any lashings or anything if you don't, but uh, there are notebooks there and pens there if you would like to, to take notes. And certainly, you know, as I've heard this from Sky many times, you know, it's, it's nice to go back to your notebooks and go back and look at those studies, uh, even while we're doing this study, to take it with you and to look at the things that I teach or that Brian teaches, uh, to go back and to check it to the scriptures and to, to write questions in there and to look things up later and, you know, it'll spark more study time, I pray, for, for each of us. So this morning, uh, we begin a study on the book of Ephesians. Um, so the author we'll get into momentarily here, but probably most of you are familiar with who the author of Ephesians is, right? So who's the author of Ephesians? Paul. Paul. Always a good answer, right? If you're asking who's the writer of, a, of an epistle in the New Testament, Paul's usually a pretty good answer, uh, as he wrote 13 of them, uh, 14 if you include Hebrews. And so how many books are in the New Testament? Who remembers that from? There's a a question off the 1689 test. How many books are in the New Testament? 27. 27, good. So 13, 14 out of 27, you're talking about half of the New Testament was written by Paul. Okay, so uh, we're going to start in the book of Acts. So if you will, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 18. And as you're doing that, uh, I'm just going to look at verse 1 of Ephesians here because that's where we see evidence even of it, the letter, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Uh, so chapter 3, verse 1 says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Uh, so Paul claiming, you know, st- st- staking claim to the fact that he is the author of this letter. Um, so with that being said, why would we be going to the book of Acts? Uh, well, some of you that have been here for quite some time know, as we've gone through other letters that, that Paul writes, Uh, We go back to Acts to trace to see where these churches are and where the beginnings of these churches were, uh, kind of the background and the context, if you will, for the letter that is going to be written later. And so uh, the the church at Ephesus is a church that Paul was instrumental in planting. And so for many of the epistles, actually, of, of Paul, and Colossians, the other letters to churches are to churches that Paul specifically was instrumental in planting. And, and that to see those accounts, we go back to the book of Acts uh, through the three recorded missionary journeys that we have there of, of Paul's. And so uh, as some of us have been through, we, I taught on the book of Acts a couple of years ago, then we went through a church history study. So uh, for, you, for you guys, maybe this will be a little bit of a refresher to, to kind of go through these things and see these things. Uh, but that's what we're going to kind of do this morning, is do uh, what you would call a survey of, of Paul's life, kind of an overview or Cliff Notes version of uh, Paul's life and some of it here through the, the book of Acts because it's going to help us to understand the background and the context of the, the city of Ephesus and the area of Ephesus, the time frame. Uh, so remember when we start a study, whether it's preaching or teaching uh, in Sunday school or Bible studies, uh, we always want to, you know, set the context. We want to talk about the author, the date, uh, who is the main primary audience of that first century. Uh, you know, what are the context, what are the things that are happening, who are the people in powers, uh, what's happening in the church at that time. And so these things are important for us to understand as that gives us insight to the things that the author is putting towards uh, the listeners or towards the hearers. Right? Does that make sense? You guys have any thoughts or questions uh, on that or comments on that? Okay, so that's our, that's our goal for today. So let's start talking about the date then and the context, which we'll get to here momentarily. Okay, and we find this really through uh, Acts chapter 18 and 20 as, as far as it deals with Paul being at Ephesus. Okay, so let me start by kind of talking a little bit about Ephesus. Ephesus was no 
you know, small kind of third world island, you know, s small place. Ephesus was a very large, uh, you know, kind of city. It was a Roman capital at the time. Uh, it was a, a commerce center, okay, lots of trade and people coming in and out. Uh, it's much like uh, Philippi, actually, in that, that same regard, that Philippi is the same way, major cities here. Uh, so these aren't little outskirt cities that Paul's going to because he's, you know, scared of the people that are there. He's going into the heart of these big, you know, kind of uh, metropolitan areas, if you will. And this area of Ephesus was specifically known for worshiping the goddess, uh, the goddess Artemis. Okay, and I've got there in parentheses Diana because your version may say Diana. Uh, so the Greek goddess Artemis, however, uh, in Latin, that same goddess is, is titled Diana. Okay, so we're talking about the same thing. So if, you, if I read Artemis, you have Diana, it's okay. We're talking about the same goddess. And so that was the main goddess that this city worshipped. And we'll get into that a little bit more here in our introduction um, shortly. Okay, so uh, the timeline of Paul's conversion... Uh, the timeline of his mission journeys, uh, all these things are significant and important. So uh, when you think of Paul's conversion or Saul's conversion, uh, what do you think of? Anybody can tell us? T tell us about uh, maybe what chapter? What chapter in the book of Acts do we have the conversion of Saul? Guys, anybody remember? I know it's been a couple of years since our Acts study, but anything? It's okay. Acts chapter 9. Okay, Acts chapter 9, we get the account of the conversion of Saul. Uh, maybe somebody can give us some details about, remember, what an what a amazing event that was. And certainly, it's an amazing event whenever you're converted, right? Uh, but, but Saul certainly has a, a pretty significant and uh, unique, I should say, conversion story. Anybody can fill us in with some of the details of that? What does that look like for Saul? Somebody tell us about who he was, what happened to him, where it was, anything you can think of. God letters from the chief priest to go to Damascus to arrest those who were followers of the way. Good. Mm -hmm. And along the way, he came to meet Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah, he was persecuting the church, right? He was throwing believers into jail. He was, uh, in fact, we see in, in uh, you know, Acts chapter 7 in the stoning of Stephen that, that Saul was there, you know, and, and was... Uh, approving of these things. He was holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen. Uh, so he's got the blood of Christians on his hands and on his conscience. Did you have some, Frank? Oh, I was just going to say, I enjoy this conversion because it's the antithesis of a, quote, seeker-sensitive scenario. Yes. Um, I mean, Paul was in full rebellion. I, I don't... Not only do I not want to hear you share the gospel with me, I will kill you. Yeah. And and God says, that's okay. I'm going to open your eyes to the truth and your ears to the truth, and you will be saved. Amen. And so just a dramatic example of whoever you're praying for, they are not beyond the reach of God's grace and mercy. I don't care how dire external circumstances look, God yeah. is it's so easy for him to save Yep. Whomever he chooses. That's right. It's the perfect example, right? That's right. It, it's the perfect example of exactly uh, what Pastor Brian just said. And so we know that's what happens in every heart. And so he is on the way um, to, to in prison. To, he wants to gather all those followers of the way, as he said, the followers of Christ, to take them back and to put them into prison. And so on that journey, uh, the bright light that, that is mentioned uh, the Lord just comes and knocks him right off his high horse, right, that he's going on, and, and knocks him down and blinds him, and he's blinded for three days. Uh, he is then taken to a man named Ananias who is, is told by God that this, this Saul is coming to you and you're going to heal him, and I have great things for him to do. And it's pretty funny in that interaction because Ananias is like, God, I've heard about this Saul guy, and are you sure that's the guy like, that, that you want to bring to the team? Like that's the guy we're, we're talking about? And so uh, that is the guy. And so Saul is converted in an instant, just as we all are, as God changes his heart and uh, says, you're on my team now, right? You're not on that team anymore. You're now on my team. And, uh, and so that is his conversion. And now after that, um, he does take some time. So I would say to you just a timeline kind of to give us a more perspective on Paul. Um, he was converted, they say, around 34 A.D. Okay, he was born around 4 A.D.-ish. So he's about 30 years old uh, when he's converted. He then goes uh, off to 
um, Damascus and to Tarsus, where he is from. Uh, he spends three years in Arabia. Uh, we find in Galatians a, a little gap here in the book of Acts. And in uh, the Lord Jesus, you know, disciples him and grows him in his word and in his ways, uh, calls him to be an apostle. And then about 47 AD, so we got a good little gap here, about 13 years, 14 years after his conversion, uh, Barnabas comes looking for Saul, finds him uh, at Tarsus, and brings him to Antioch in Syria. So there's this uh, Syrian Antioch, there's a church there, Paul and Barnabas now are preaching and teaching at this church. And this is when the Holy Spirit says to separate Paul and Barnabas to go on these mission journeys, to go and to proclaim and to preach the gospel uh, in all the areas of, of the, the, the earth there, pretty much at that place and time. So let me just kind of put on, I hope that map comes out okay. This is a map um, of his second mission journey, journey, but this gives you a map to see of the areas in which we're talking about. Um, you'll see Tarsus is right here where, where Saul is from. Uh, Antioch is right here that we're talking about, the Syrian Antioch, because there is another uh, Antioch, which is up here, Antioch, the Pisidian Antioch. So two different places. But this was really, guys, if you remember me talking about it in uh, the study, this is really home base. Okay, this is home base of all the mission journeys. This is the church that sends Paul uh, and Barnabas out on this mission journey. And so that first journey we have in the account of chapters 13 and 14, and they go to the island of Cyprus here. Uh, then they come up into Pamphylia. They come to, if you've read through the book of Acts, you'll see Antioch and uh, Iconium. Lystra is where actually Paul was stoned to death and dragged outside the city, and they left him. They thought he was dead. And he gets up, and he goes back into the city the next day and preaches again. Uh, then to Derb. And so this, all this area here is, is called Galatia. Okay? So that's their first missionary journey. When he comes back from that journey, that takes about a year, and he writes the book of Galatians. Okay? Uh, an easy way, actually, to remember uh, Saul's, Paul's writings is on his first missionary journey, he wrote one book. On his second missionary journey, he wrote two books. On his third missionary journey, he wrote three books. Okay, so on that first journey, he writes the book of Galatians. He comes back, and now this is going to lead us to, you'll see as we get to Ephesus here, the second missionary journey. Uh, they leave Antioch. They head up through Tarsus, where he's from, and then they journey on uh, through the places that he had already been to where they had preached and planted churches to come and check on these churches. Paul was not one who just set up shop, proclaimed the gospel, and left these churches hanging. He always came back to them to check on them. He sent letters. That's, in fact, what we're going to be getting into here in Ephesus. These letters that we have to us are letters sent back to these churches that he has ministered to, that he wants to teach them doctrine. He wants to tell them uh, and exhort them to apply these things and to live godly lives. Uh, all the things that we get application out of, he's sending them to these churches that of these people he's ministered to, these people that he loves and cares for. Okay, so in this... Uh, and this is just kind of, you know, not in notes. This is just a lot of stuff that I want to share with you. Certainly any comments or inputs or insights that you have, uh, you know, we can add and, and we always, you know, want to do that. Uh, just to say, I want to get us a greater understanding maybe of Paul and, and who we're talking about, okay, the Apostle Paul. So he uh, comes through back here to Lystra where he was uh, stoned in the first trip. That's where he actually meets Timothy. He asked Timothy to go on this journey with him. That's where their relationship starts, okay? Uh, then it says that the Holy Spirit prevented him from going into Asia on this trip, and he went up to Troas up here. If you can see that, that's right up here. Uh, and this is where he actually uh, meets Luke, and Luke joins the party now and goes on this journey, and Luke is the author of the book of Acts. So he starts to write all these things that are happening. And then they go up into uh, Macedonia, which uh, you're going to probably be familiar with a lot of these names because that is when he went to Philippi. Um, in Acts chapter 16, and Lydia, and the conversion of the jailer is Paul and Silas. And I say Silas now because uh, Paul and, it's now Silas going on the missionary journey with him. Because the first one was Barnabas, and there was an interaction with Barnabas' cousin, John Mark, who is the author of the Gospel of Mark. So there was an interaction with them, and they kind of broke fellowship that Mark uh, went on that first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. And instead of going on, he left from Silas and went home. And Paul was upset about that, and they actually parted ways. Okay, and that's significant too, because later on we will see how Paul 
uh, we know has restored his relationship and reconciled, I should say, his relationship to John Mark because we see that some in, in his later letters about how he writes about how Mark has helped me in ministering to me. And, and so we see a break in fellowship and a reconciliation that happens amongst brothers. And so that's a good thing for us to certainly always recognize and look at. So uh, when they get back to go on the second journey, as I rewind a little bit, uh, Paul and Barnabas say, hey, let's go back and check on these churches, and, and Barnabas wants to take Mark, and Paul says, no, I don't want to take Mark, because he ditched us in the last one. And so Barnabas takes Mark, and they go on their own journey, and now Paul takes Silas, and Paul and Silas go on this journey. So, and, and on the third journey, it's Paul and Silas again. But as I've already showed you, we also have Timothy and Luke. So remember, we kind of focus on Paul a lot, but there were many believers and many brothers and sisters who were part of the church at this time, right? And there's many other, Peter was out later on his uh, mission journeys. And so the Lord is spreading the gospel by putting uh, believers in, and spreading them out. And really, you guys, what was the primary way in which he did that? How did God get people in the, in the area of Judea, which will be down here, okay, with Israel, uh, how did he get them to leave here and spread through all, out all these lands to share the gospel? That's right. Persecution. The church was being persecuted uh, by the Jewish leaders and, and by those in, in uh, Jerusalem. And so there was a church in Jerusalem, we know that, and that James, the brother of Jesus, was one of the leaders in that church. Peter was there for a long time. In fact, Peter didn't go on his missionary journeys, it appears, till after uh, uh, Paul had already done a couple of his. So we just see all these men going out, and all that to say that Paul wasn't this lone ranger, you know, that was out there doing everything on his own. <laughs> Uh, he had the support of brothers and sisters throughout his missionary journey, not to mention all the people that were praying for him and, and supporting him. Uh, but him being led and guided by the Spirit, he goes up into Macedonia. Uh, and so we've got Philippi there. We have Thessalonica there. We have Berea there. Uh, then he gets down into Greece over here. And so when you get to, like, Acts chapter uh, 17, you have Athens. And remember, as he speaks to... Uh, uh, to those at Mars Hill about the unknown God, if you're familiar with that, that's when that happens. Then we go to chapter 18, and he gets over to Corinth over there, and he spends about 18 months uh, in Corinth, and that's where he actually writes his two letters on this trip. He writes a letter of First and Second Thessalonians back to the church at Thessalonica that he had just left a little while ago. So you'll see this pattern. He plants churches, he leaves he goes to another one, to another one, and then he will hear of concerns and hear of things and write letters back to those churches and then also go back to visit them. Uh, so again, this is the heart of Paul we see is constantly for the church, constantly for God's people, always praying as we'll see in the beginning of this letter. We're going to see two prayers of, of Paul's in the, in the letter of Ephesians. But through the other epistles of his, you see uh, it, usually starting with a prayer and saying, you know, may God increase your knowledge. May he increase your love for one another. He's always got a heart for the church. Uh, and it's not just, you know, his church. It's us four, close the door, no more, you know, kind of thing. It's, it's not just this church that he's, he's loving. He's called to, to be a missionary, to go out and to spread the gospel into areas that haven't been reached, right? And so uh, it's loving the church, you know, global church, capital C church, the body of Christ, uh, as we have visitors from, of the body of Christ from other churches, you know, this is not their home church. That's what it's like is to continue to pray for one another, to continue to, to have this love uh, that we have because of Christ. So this now leads us to uh, after Corinth, which actually another uh, thing that happens in Corinth that's worth uh, speaking of is that he meets Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth. Uh, these are two believers he meets there, and they immediately attach onto Paul and to his entourage and they journey with him uh, by sea over to, you'll see here now, Ephesus, which is in Asia. So they make it over to Ephesus. <clears throat> Aquila and Priscilla actually stay in Ephesus. And Paul, we will see, does not. Okay, so let's get to Acts 18. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is now the first time, the first visit we have recorded of Paul uh, to the city of Ephesus. Okay, let's look at verses 18 and 21. And uh, who could read that for us? Anybody? Anybody bring the reading voice today? Nice and loud can, can do that for us. Acts 18, 18 to 21. Uh, hold on, I'm getting there. <laughs> 18 to 21? Yes, sir. 
After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At so, sorry, context there is verse 18 is starting here at Corinth, and they're setting sail, as he said, to go back where? To Syria and Antioch. But it's going to say he's going to stop here in Ephesus. Okay? Thanks, Greg. Now, I can't pronounce this, but at Centria? Centria? Good. He had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus and left him there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. Okay, good. So that's the, the journey there on the, on the map there. And I hope that's helpful. I know some of us are visual learners. Um, but as we get into this now, this is the first visit we see of Paul to Ephesus. Uh, and so we see that it's, it's brief. It says he reasoned in the synagogue uh, with, with some Jews. And you'll see that uh, that is a, a, an occurrence that continues to repeat itself. It, it was Paul's practice that all of these places on that first journey, on the second journey that he would go, the, when he, the first thing he would do when he went to the city was he would go to the synagogue. And why would he do that? What do you guys think? Why would Paul first go to the synagogue in, in most of the cities that he went to? Because he was Jewish. Okay. And and. So then who would be then at the synagogues? Jews. Jews. Okay. Uh, they would have a background and understanding of this God that, that Paul believes in. And so he would first go to the Jews to try to tell them, to preach to them, that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, that you should believe in this Jesus, this one that I was persecuting uh, and hated. And, and so he tries to, to speak the good news of the gospel to the Jews first. Then he goes out from there. Excuse me, and we'll see that his strategy changes later as the Holy Spirit shows him that the Jews, you know, essentially have eyes that are closed and ears uh, that are deafened. And he says, you know, I've talked to you guys. You are not receiving. I am now going to the Gentiles to tell them. And so we see that shift there in Paul uh, becoming, you know, Paul's known as the uh, missionary or the apostle to the Gentiles, right? So uh, we see that that is the case. But here he starts in the synagogue reasoning with some Jews, Okay, uh, and they invite him to stay longer. And so I've got here on our timeline. This is about 52, 53 A.D. Okay, for uh, for for the timeline. So they ask him to stay, but he declines, as he says he's going to make a trip to Jerusalem. Um, and then he says again, "I will come back if God wills." And so uh, that's a great example also for us to to do as the scriptures tell us, right? To to do if you make plans. Where is that, James? Uh, I think that says that, that uh, you shouldn't make plans for yourself, but if you do, you should say rather what God wills, right, if the Lord wills. So it's okay to make plans, and it's good for us to make plans for vacation or to do whatever, but we say if the Lord wills, I will, I will go on vacation. If the Lord wills, we will all make it over to the, the sanctuary here shortly. So uh, all things are in accordance to God's will, and so he does make a plan to, to come back and see them. Okay, so he does do that, and, uh, and that does come to fruition. And so we see this is going to be on his third uh, missionary journey. If you look over at Acts chapter 19, uh, we will see that it says, It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. This is now the beginning of Paul's third mission journey. He has made his way back to Jerusalem, as he said, he went back to home base, which is Syrian Antioch Church, and then he left from there, and I don't have a, a picture of, uh, of that one, but just so you can see it here, he left from Syria, and now this time he goes and he sets for Ephesus, and he reaches Ephesus, and that's the first place that we have, um, that we hear about in this third missionary journey. Okay, so uh, look over at chapter 20, please verse 31 because it says therefore be on alert remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears so we'll get to this kind of heartfelt uh, thing that's happening here in this discussion uh, shortly but it gives us a timeline here how long does it look like Paul was in Ephesus for three years okay so he spends a good amount of time in Ephesus actually while he's in Ephesus for three years uh, remember, third journey, how, how, many, how many letters did he write on that journey? Three. Three. Two of them come while he's in Ephesus at this time. He sends 
uh, letters to, to Corinth, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. He also makes a trip by water, by boat, to uh, Corinthians, uh, to Corinth and back as well. Uh, so that's what he does with some of the time that he is there while he's ministering uh, to this church as they, those Jews asked him to come back. So he is there for quite some time, and uh, I believe this is the longest recorded time that we have in any one place for Paul. Uh, we see 18 months for Corinth, but we see three years that he spends in, in Ephesus in this major place. Okay, uh, Let's look at chapter 19. If someone will please read uh, the first seven verses, and let's kind of see what happens at his time here in Ephesus. <clears throat> Who's got that for us? And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Hmm. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. Okay, thank you, Sherry. So we see here the conversion of some disciples. And they're disciples of whom does it say? John the Baptist. So we've got some disciples here of John the Baptist, 12 of them in fact. And this is also a text to show us that there is a difference, uh, a distinguishing factor between John's baptism and what we call believer's baptism. Because do you see they've been baptized in John's baptism, which Paul says uh, is a baptism of repentance. Okay, so uh, he's asked about the Holy Spirit. They don't know what he's talking about. And so uh, without getting too far into a rabbit trail on that, he, we can talk about that later. Um, this is uh, Paul speaking to this, these disciples and giving them more information about Christ and the Holy Spirit revealing to them uh, the truth of the gospel, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the one uh, that your teacher, in fact, John, was pointing to and telling you about. And so they are then... Uh, converted, and they are uh, have hands laid upon them, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them as they are uh, regenerated, right, and, and born again by the power of the Spirit. Okay, so we see that's uh, kind of the, the beginning of his time here in Ephesus. Look at uh, verses 8 and 9. It says, He entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient... You see it? Some of who were becoming hard and disobedient? Good, the Jews, those at the synagogue. Uh, speaking evil of the way, and so, Tim, you mentioned that, the way. Why don't you, do you think, brother, you could tell us, what, is, what does that mean? What's that mean when he's saying the way? Why are they saying the way? What does that mean? I uh, the followers of Christ. Yeah, yeah, good. So before we see, uh, you know, them called being believers or saints, and I think it's at Antioch, uh, that, that believers are first called Christians. As we're talking about this church at Antioch, it says in Antioch they were first called Christians. So for, for a while, there was no name for these people, right? They were followers, and they would refer to it as followers of the way. And, and so some of your versions may even have a capital W on that way, because who is the way? Jesus Christ, right? John 14, 6, I am the way. Uh, so Jesus is the way, and so these are, are talking about exactly, as Tim says, uh, followers of Christ. So they're beginning to speak evil about Christ, okay, uh, before the people. It says, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And look at verse 10. This took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So, we see in verses 8 and 9, he was forced to leave the synagogues. And, and why? Why was he forced to leave? What does it say? Why did he leave? The Jews are hardened their hearts. Yeah. They were, they were, they were, they were hardened, and they were, uh, you know, against what, what Paul was saying, and, and debating him, and perhaps getting, uh, you know, um, physical. We, we don't know what that looks like, but perhaps persecution was, was starting to arise. And so Paul decides to take the disciples and, and to leave. And then we learn in verse 9 and 10 that this person, Tyrannus, 
uh, has a, a building or a, a big home or something to where he provides a place for Paul to start his own seminary, if you will, right? Paul has this school uh, that he is teaching now for two years to Jews and Greeks, it says, right? So to, to any who will come and listen, uh, Paul is willing to, to share the gospel and then to also teach and train them. Because do you think if Paul was there for three years, do you think they were getting sound doctrinal teaching of theology? Of course they were, right? Okay, so they're, they're maturing. Uh, it's not that he just went on these mission journeys and, like I said, stayed for a short amount of times and left and never checked on them and didn't care about them. Uh, he was instrumental in wanting them to grow uh, in their sanctification process, right? Any uh, comments or, or thoughts of, of Ephesus or, or Paul or anything so far? What do you guys what do you guys got? You know, it's interesting how different versions uh, might the text maybe reflect a little bit different thought on it. And, and this is Revised Standard. It says Paul argued. Yes. With, with people rather than quote reason. Yes. And so then where does that you know it it puts a different emphasis maybe on Sure. Um, yeah, and I, I personally didn't look through my studies this time of of what that word would best be translated as. Um, but certainly I think they carry the same kind of weight, whether you want to say reason, argue, debate, you know, discuss, you know, I'm sure there was some uh, good discussion in, in love. I'm sure there was probably some argumentative debating, you know, going on. As we know, if you've ever spoken to uh, unbelievers, that has a tendency to happen, right? It has a tendency, and certainly we try to stay even keel. We try to stay low key. We try to stay in doing it in love, uh, but it's not. Uh, it's not always in our control, as there's another person involved in this conversation, and so they may get heated at you. Uh, so those things can certainly happen. Good point. Anybody else? Okay, well then let's, uh, let's continue on our journey. Let's look at uh, Acts 19, verse 23. And this is a longer one, so I'm going to give this to someone uh, who might want to read that and save my voice here a little bit. If somebody wants to read, I've got it up there. Acts 19, 23, uh, through to the first verse of chapter 20. Don't let the visitors get all the blessings, you guys. <laughs> all right, I'm doing it. Let's go. About that time, uh, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, so here we're now learning and finding out about this, this goddess, was bringing no little business, no little business, notice that, so it was a big business, to the craftsmen. These uh, he gathered together in the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends on this business, this business of making these, these false idols of this false goddess. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, praise the Lord, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Amen to that. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours should fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. When they heard this, they were filled with rage, and they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus. Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. So here we have mentioned two other names of those who have joined Paul's traveling party, right? So again, he is not going by himself. He has uh, Timothy, he has Paul, he has Silas, he has Barnabas, you know, on and on with, with other disciples that are, are making the journey with him. Uh, verse 30, and when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. Also, some of the uh, Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him repeatedly, urged him not to venture into the theater. So then, some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and the majority did not know for what reason they had all come together. Sounds about right, right? When you think of a riot, 
Uh, what do you even think of? We've seen these things on the news last year, whether it's BLM riots, whether it's riots of whatever uh, kind of thing we might have seen in, in you know, American history or even beyond that. A lot of people just kind of join the crowd, right? And that really speaks kind of to Romans 1 uh, about, and Romans 2 about how they, uh, they not only like to do it themselves, but they urge other people to come and join in their sinfulness, right? So the crowd, when there is a crowd, you'll notice people just go to the crowd to see what's happening, right? Like, why is this crowd here? And, the, and they're attracted to it. And so we see that a lot of the people that are there don't even know what they're talking about or what's happening. And so it says, some are saying this, some are saying that, and there's a bunch of confusion going on here. Verse 33. Some of the crowd concluded that it was Alexander since the Jews had put him forward, and having motioned with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a singular outcry arose from them as they all shouted for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. After quieting the crowd, the, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there, after all, who does not know that the city of, Ephesian, of the Ephesians is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which has fell from heaven? So, since these are undeniable facts, you ought to keep calm and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here, uh, who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and the proconsuls are available, let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in the lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events, since there is no real cause for it, and in this connection, we will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. So this is a riot that takes place. We see it's because. Why? What's the reasoning? This man Demetrius started this uprising, right? What was the purpose? What what was behind it? What what was driving? He was going to lose his livelihood, all his money. Yeah, I, I'm losing I'm losing my way here. Like this guy Paul and his people are making a big stink around this place. And did you hear how awesome it is that he said not only in Ephesus but all over the world, this Paul is known for doing this. And in their view, he's sowing discord. This Paul is known for coming in and causing division among people and among cities and ruining our livelihood so that I can't feed my family now because this guy is saying that these idols, so they're idol makers, they're silversmiths, they're making these idols and selling them to people that are coming in and out of the area to buy these things. They're making good living, it sounds like, right? And Paul is ruining that, and we can't have that. And so he gets his crew, and, and again, the crowds just bring more crowds. And so we see this riot... The point of all this is, this is what causes Paul to leave Ephesus, okay? He's been there three years. He's been preaching and proclaiming the truth of the gospel. He's been teaching, and now this causes Paul to leave Ephesus uh, for the well-being of, not that it, it seems you could tell there, right? Was Paul really consider, uh, considering his own well-being most of the time? He was ready to go in the theater, right, and make a defense, but he also has to think about the disciples and the other people around him, and, and obviously, ultimately, the Holy Spirit guiding him on where to go, uh, that this was not... Uh, look, you can only stand on one hill and die on it, right? You can only die one time on that hill. So uh, this was the Holy Spirit telling Paul, this is not the hill to die on. So he leaves Ephesus after doing this great work. Yeah? It sounds yeah. like the, you know, the whole thing is that they're really leading the, the riot... You know, the, all the people in their way of, you know, the, he's blaspheming our God. You know what I mean? Yes. That's how they got them all in the uproar. The, uh, That's right. That was their weapon. Of choice. That's right. Yep, he's turning people and sucking them away. And we know, you know, as the guy said there, we know these are 36. These are undeniable facts, you know, is what he says. Our God is the, our goddess is the goddess. And everyone knows that. So don't worry about these guys, you know. Yeah, good. It's their own greed that led them to, to even speak that way. You know? That's right. That's right. Preacher. Yes. So uh, same kind of things going on today, right? <laughs> In that uh, they were going and saying these are undeniable facts about uh, Diana and Artemis and the temple and Zeus and heaven and all that sort of stuff. 
And were they facts? That's right. Okay. What, 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 what's the correlation to that that we see in this day and age? Uh, evolution. They're teaching it. It, it. It's not facts, but they say these are undeniable yep. scientific facts. And it takes more faith to be someone who believes in evolution no doubt. than someone who is a Christian. It, it's not supported by facts. It's not science. That's it's right. a religion. It is. Well, you've said it well, and, and we've talked about that around here a lot. Actually, we're preaching in the book of Genesis, so we've talked about it fairly recently to say exactly what you said in the last line there, that it is a religion. That, that's the evolu the evolution is the religion of the secular world, and that's what they're indoctrinating through the school systems and through everything that they do. Uh, yeah, you're exactly right. To say that this is factual truth, it's the same. And look, so it's nothing new, right? It's nothing new, and it wasn't new here in Ephesus with Paul. It was going on you know, long before that as well, because we know uh, that since sin, right, uh, people have been not worshiping and following the one true God. And this is what happens. Romans 1 tells us when you don't do that, you define your own gods, and you make your own God, and you worship your own gods, or and yourself, in wanting to be God. Sort of here, almost here, Paul telling them uh, you cannot serve God and mammon. Totally. That's right. Amen. Amen. Good. Okay, we've got uh, four minutes. Uh, let's Let's go ahead with a couple more here then. Let's look at the end of this journey, okay? Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 20, and let's flip over to, uh, you know what, that's a long text. Change my mind on that. We've only got three minutes now. We're going to pause there. We're going to stop there, and we'll pick up there, uh, Lord willing, next week. So, uh, yeah, what other, what other thoughts, comments, inputs, insights? Uh, yeah, good. I think how you guys bring it into... Uh, certainly, we like to go to application, and we certainly see, as, as Tim makes the point, and, and Greg also to say, these things are still happening today, right? And probably to a greater degree, uh, because there's more people. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the, certainly as we just look at our own country, you know, we know the majority of the people believe, as you said, and, and they believe it's factual and it's evidence-based, and, and it's not. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's the blindness that we see of the world, right? And the scriptures tell us that. First, um, you know, think of 1 Corinthians 1, uh, you know, and, and clearly Paul saying that they are blinded, you know, blinded uh, by, by the world and, and that the gospel, remember, is, is folly to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Um, so it is foolishness uh, to them. And so we've got to continue to be, to be preaching it and teaching it and telling it and, and pray that God will be gracious to people. People believe that evolution is facts, then that makes the Bible a fairy tale. That's right. Which is exactly what they say. Yeah. Oh, you believe in Santa Claus and fairy tales and stories and, yeah. and those who aren't saved can't believe in God anyway. They That's can't right. believe in the gospel. Right. It's just not gonna happen. It's not possible. Yeah, you're right, Sky. You know, as as Brian mentioned earlier, I mean, he's gotta be the one, the Lord has to be the one to open their eyes. Uh, to understand this truth that we believe in and that we know is truth, they don't. But neither did we right. before God clicked the switch and changed your heart and caused you to be born again. You didn't believe it either, you know? Uh, so, again, we've got to just, just pray that God will be gracious and do what, what only he can do. You know? well, in, the, in the same way Paul says, well, I'm going to preach to you about this unknown God. And yes. He says that I've become all things to all people, that by some means some might get saved. That's right. We need to be ready to do the same thing and to be able to reach people who think evolution is a fact uh, by doing the investigation ourselves and finding out the truth. That's so correct. So that we can present, present that to them. Because if you go up to someone who thinks the Bible is a fairy tale and start quoting scripture, it's going to hit a brick wall. Oh, amen. Amen. And a, and a lot of that, I, you know, I think we find too is uh, relationships, right? It, it's it's helpful also to, um, you know, it comes into like the argument thing, the debate thing a lot of times if you're just speaking with a stranger and, and things kind of get amped up. Uh, but, you know, it, it can be developed perhaps greater in a, when you're developing a relationship with someone uh, and, and the Lord's presenting opportunities for you to, to connect with them and to speak truths to them. And certainly can God, can God, change a stranger as you give the gospel to them the first time yep certainly can do it whenever he wants to uh and it's that easy for him so you know all of them i think are are good approaches as long as we're just being obedient you know be obedient and keep saying it keep telling it to people 
and, and it may be that they've heard it a thousand times and they've never heard it because God hasn't opened their ears to hear it and they haven't been saved. But it may be that the thousand and first time, God decides to be gracious and then Holy Spirit moves them and gives them ears to hear the gospel. So, you know, as Paul says to, you know, we'll, we will reap if we don't, you know, get tired of working, continue to do it. Uh, so we, we've got to continue to, uh, to do as Paul did and just continue to, to stay steadfast in faith and stay to the calling by, by which we've been called. I think uh, we see here in these scriptures that uh, we're called to be able to reason and that if we don't address the objections that somebody has to the having faith in the Lord, that we are not reasoning. We're just blindly chanting what we've been told without having the uh, information to show them the way to the truth. Yes. Which means what then, everybody? It means that you need to be informed. That's right. So that you can can uh, reason. We need to be equipped, right? And so you think of 1 Peter 3.15, and always be prepared to give an answer uh, for the hope that you have within you. Uh, right? That's apologetics. That's knowing what you believe and why you believe it and being able to do, uh, as Tim says, being able to have intelligent conversations with people. Uh, you know, we don't want to have uh, them always be on the offensive and feel like we don't have the answers. And so with that being said also, I think of, you know, a lot of people will feel inadequate and feel like they don't have uh, the answers and they're not equipped. And so a lot of people are also, you know, not as mature, say, as others. And so a lot of times perhaps you're not equipped and you're, you feel like you're not ready and you want to, uh, to continue to grow in that. Well, that's the goal. We're all supposed to continue to grow in that. And so while a young believer may feel unequipped and inadequate because they don't have the scripture memorized, say, that Pastor Ryan does, uh, your goal is to continue to grow in that way and grow in that area, whether you're you know, seasoned, uh, you know, seasoned believer and you've been saved for 50 years and you can quote the whole Bible or you just got saved this morning. It's the same process for all of us, right? We've all got to put the work in. We've all got to get on the treadmill and, and do the work so that we can, you know, continue to be more equipped by God to be greater use by him. All right, well, it's time to close. Um, Sky, would you mind, brother? Thank you. Father God, we just thank you so much, Lord, for this day and for this time to come together and to just learn and grow in your gospel, Lord, to better equip ourselves for for every opportunity that may come up for us to spread the gospel to others that, that may not know you or may not have ever heard about your gospel or the truth and the hope and the word that you've given us. Lord, we just, uh, we're just so thankful for that opportunity. We're mm-hmm. so thankful for your salvation and for for choosing us to, mm-hmm. to be your children and, and to, um, to be your vessel and to, to spread your gospel, Lord. Just, uh, Lord, just please just just be with us and help us to, um, to grow stronger and stronger every day in and, and, and your knowledge and your truth so that we can, we can be good servants to you and, and as a pastor that you have got to go along every chance that we get to you too. Uh, we thank you for the fellowship time today and to come together and to worship you, Lord, and just, uh, just help us to make every day of our life uh, like a, a great day at church, a great Sunday. And, and just to fill our days with um, the force of the year, Lord, and mm-hmm. loving you and keeping you at the forefront of everything we do. Take your son, Jesus, and everything. Amen. Amen.